Hello, my name is John Glover. I'm the Director of Artistic Planning here at Kaufman Music Center. It's my pleasure to welcome you to Merkin Hall. Uh, at Kaufman Music Center, we are a dynamic community. Uh, we educate the musicians of tomorrow, and we present the leading artists on this stage uh, every day. Um, we have actually a few students from our special music school here tonight who are studying Colson's book, uh, so welcome to them as well. If you look on the back of your program book, you'll see information about the Ecstatic Music Series. This is a series where we present the leading, contemporary, cutting-edge, genre-defying music of today. There are 10 concerts this year. We'd love to see you at them. Uh, and for the intellectually curious, our concert series range from the classical to Broadway, so please check out our programs in the lobby. At Kaufman, we believe that music making is an act of community, listening, and collaboration. And in that spirit, we are so thrilled to have the Times talk here with Colson Whitehead, and I'd like to welcome Michelle from Times. Good evening, everyone. I'm Michelle Gray, the creative and programming director of the New York Times live conversation series, Times Talks. For over 20 years, Times Talks has paired New York Times journalists with the brightest and boldest creative minds from the fields of art, music, theater, social justice, film, and of course, literature. I'm delighted to welcome you to tonight's event with Pulitzer Prize and National Book Award winning author, Colson Whitehead, who's here to discuss his recently published book, The Nickel Boys. In this acclaimed follow-up to his number one New York Times bestseller, The Underground Railroad, Whitehead brilliantly dramatizes another strand of American history through the story of two boys sentenced to a hellish reform school in Jim Crow era Florida. Moderating tonight's conversation is Monica Drake, the assistant managing editor of the New York Times, overseeing new digital features and the projects. In tonight's conversation, Monica will speak to Colson about his creative process, the civil rights movement, and the history of race in America, among other things. Please join me in giving a very warm welcome to Monica Drake and Colson Whitehead. How do you do? Welcome. Yes, thanks. <laughs> Thanks for doing this. Thanks for talking to us tonight. No, it's great. I get out of the house. I shaved. Um, <laughs> I live close by, so I could be self-medicating 20 minutes after I'm out of here. <laughs> awesome. So, Good. Yeah. I'm glad you could fit us in. Um, I'm, I have a few questions for you, so I'm going to get right to it. Most of the questions that I have initially, I, I want to talk about Nickel Boys. Um, congratulations for being nominated for a National Book Award already. Thanks. It's very exciting. Um, but I first want to talk a little bit about just how you come up with what you're going to write about. So you've written um, nine books, right? One about poker. Surely, yes. Another about uh, zombies, uh, a memoir, a fictionalized memoir of Sag Harbor, another book about um, obviously Underground Railroad, a slave epic, and, and now this reformatory, and you're like, you know, racked up a lot of prizes along the way. How do you figure out, of all the things in the world, I'm going to write about that thing, and not only that, I'm going to do it in a totally unpredictable way? Right, yeah. I mean, I get ideas from all different sorts of places. You know, uh, The Intuitionist, my first book about elevator inspectors. I was watching 2020, the, uh, the TV <laughs> show. <laughs> And inter interviewed an escalator inspector. I was like, oh, that's a weird job. You know. Um, uh, Apex hides the hurts. I was, there was an article in, Times, in the New York Times Magazine about um, the naming of Prozac. And I was like, mm. oh, that's a weird job, like naming products. Uh, <laughs> Zone One, uh, my zombie book, came from a dream. You know, I, um, dream. I uh, uh, watched like Night of the Living Dead and Dawn of the Dead at a very early age. And for, for many, many years, I would have zombie dreams, like once a month, for decades. And sometimes they're fast, sometimes they're slow. Uh, sometimes they get me, sometimes not. And then um, about 10, depending on my psychological weather. And then about 10 years ago, I was um, going through some stuff in my life. Mm -hmm. My father had just died. Um, I was about to get divorced. Uh, there's some hints I was about to get divorced such as getting a divorce lawyer tipped me off. <laughs> that was going to happen. 
Um, and then, but, but every summer I would have friends out to Sag Harbor, where mm -hmm. I rent my aunt's house. And um, I, sh I, I probably should not have had guests that year. Um, <laughs> because the house is old, my grandfather built it, uh, the walls are very thin, mm. and you can hear everything, it's like a mm -hmm. no-sex house. I try to <laughs> establish, uh, you know, July 4th, we'll uh, have some barbecuing, some fireworks, no mm -hmm. sex. Um, <laughs> but I woke up, you know, uh, that first day, and I heard my friends, and I was like, they're so happy, like, mm -hmm. I just wish I wasn't here. And so I will myself <laughs> back to sleep. And in my dream, I was in mm -hmm. New York, and I couldn't go into my living room because I didn't know if I'd, they'd swept the zombies out yet. Oh my gosh. And so I woke up and I was like, oh, that's a cool idea mm -hmm. for a story. Mm -hmm. What do you do when the apocalypse is winding down? Someone has to get rid of the extra zombies. And then usually if you get up in the middle of the night and write a right. note down uh, from a dream, you mm -hmm. wake up and it's something stupid like, kill my dad and make out with my mother, you know? <laughs> um, uh, but in this case, I got a, a story out of it. <laughs> Do you still dream about zombies then? Or no, did, it, did cured that, it, totally it cured it. It cured it, actually. I've had like three zombie dreams the last 10 years, okay. so it was worth it. It's useful. <laughs> so is there a through line here? Have you ever like looked at what you've written and said, you know what, actually, you know, these stories are very different, but, you know, this is going to be what people say about this work that sort of ties it together, or is it just... Um, sort of improvising. I sort of, yeah, just, uh, um, you know, you asked about how do I, you know, pick things, and if it stays with me over time and argues for its usefulness as a, as a story. So Underground Railroad, I had the idea in 2000, but it was 14 years before I went to it. And, you know, if you're, if you're, still, you're still interested uh, 14 years later, that's an argument in, in its favor. And then I do switch genres a lot, and I think uh, it just came naturally to me, you know, I, I, looking back, I really loved, uh, you know, growing up in the 70s and 80s, uh, watching Kubrick movies and listening to David Bowie. Hmm. And Kubrick would do his war movie and a science mm -hmm. fiction movie and his horror movie. And David Bowie would have a different persona with each book. So it just seemed that was a way of being an artist. If you know how to do something, why do it again? And so, um, and, 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 and mixing it up, you know, keeps it challenging for me. It does confuse people who are like, I hate zombies, but I love your <laughs> you know, tender coming of age story. So, <laughs> right, right, right. Um, that was me with the poker. I was like, I, I, yeah, I like Uncle you, but Bob, I Yeah, Uncle Bob, gambled away your college yeah. fund. You know, I don't want to read about poker. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So. Um, You know, you wrote a satirical piece for the book review a while back. I don't know if you remember this um, piece, but it was, uh, the headline was What to Write Next. Do you remember writing this? I do. And, <laughs> and uh, one category <laughs> was, about, uh, was about a little known historical fact. And you wrote, uh, people like to be educated about tragedies that they've never shaken their heads sadly over before. <laughs> and so um, that piece kind of reads almost like it's either a playbook or you've totally changed your mind on, on your approach to fiction. Sure, is no, it, I mean, uh, you know, that, I was sort of, that was around 2009, I, was, I guess I was also angry that year, and I would, <laughs> I would do like a lot of these weird like anti-writing pieces, like making fun of craft and stuff like that. Um, so, but, um, you know, I, I made fun of things that I'd written uh, before in that piece and things I knew I'd write, like a historical <laughs> novel about um, slavery. Right, you mentioned and that. So um, I think I had to tear down these different sort of genres and modes in my, in my, for me so that I could figure out what I like about them, what's cliched about them. <laughs> um, and uh, you know, the same way I approach any sort of new storytelling mode, what do I like about this tradition, what do I want to throw out. And so that piece was sort of, um, trying to tear things down so that I could figure out what I could discover in the rubble, I guess. Mm -hmm. um, I didn't, uh, I don't know if I did an accurate count, but I do think you ended up doing like, I think eight of the- Sure, or some probably. things that you might have- I haven't done like the romance yet. Um, oh, that's true. But uh, I am taking time. notes on a love story set on the eve of the Russian Revolution. Uh, there are a lot of white people in it, so for research on watching <laughs> Golden Girls, <laughs> Golden Girls reruns, taking notes. Um, so I might get to that one at that point, at some point. I don't even know how you research something like that. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I, I know obviously uh, you've been a writer for a while, and Underground Railroad was like, you know, 
your first like ginormously successful book. Um, you sure, know, you've had useful. a lot of successful books, but this was like the one that, you know, sort of, I think everyone knew. Um, how did you, after writing that, um, set it aside and, and finish Nickel Boys without worrying about like, you know, whether Oprah would like it or, you know. <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, I think in terms of other people's expectations, mm -hmm. they are literally other people's expectations, <laughs> so they don't really bug me. Um, I stuck to my usual thing of just not trying to fuck it up page by page. Like, <laughs> basically I'm on my desk like, don't fuck it up, Colson. Don't fuck it up, Colson. Mm -hmm. um, that's my <laughs> mantra. And um, it was the same with my first book. It was the same with Nickel Boys. Um, and what does that mean? Like, what does fucking it up mean? What does that look like uh, for, for you? Well, I think, you know, uh, I have an idea for a book. And I think the idea is really good. It stayed with me. I've, I've been outlining it. And then there's my weaknesses as a, as a writer and a person. And then maybe in the middle, there's like a good story that works out. <laughs> And so, um, yeah, I mean, uh, I was very committed to the, the idea of the Nickel Boys, and I felt very um, compelled to work on it. So I was worried about that. And, mm -hmm. and really, you know, all the books are hard. They don't get, whether it goes well or poorly, the next time you sit down, it's just you and the page again. So, you know. Um. So I, I want to ask a little bit about the Nickel Boys. And, sure. and ha so you found that story, again, it's one of those stories that I guess stayed with you. You learned about it and... I was, yeah, goofing off on Twitter. Uh, oh, wow, productive in, Twitter usage. In the it's summer impressive. of 2014, <laughs> yes. Um, and, you know, the story of the Dozier School, it was a reform school where a lot of abuses happened, physical, sexual. Uh, some kids were, were killed, uh, according to legend. Um, finally closed after 110 years uh, of being in use. And so the story of the abuses were, were covered a lot in the Florida papers, not so much in the national media, um, but they were excavating the sites to sell the land and they found 55 unmarked graves. Um, and so they were doing you know, forensic examinations and some kids died from influenza and then some of them had shotgun pellets in their rib cages and blunt force trauma to their heads. And so that made the national media and that happened the day I was goofing off on Twitter. And um, they, had, they were interviewing former students, you know, men in their 60s mm -hmm. and 70s, and they were mostly uh, white, but most of the kids actually were African American. And so immediately I just wondered what kind of story the black part of campus would have to tell. And then also, it was the summer of the, of uh, Ferguson, Missouri, Michael Brown had been killed in a protest. Eric Garner was killed a few weeks later in Staten Island, and it seemed that a lot of times people get away with doing bad things, and that certainly was true of Dozier. And if there's one Dozier, how many other things, how many other places like Dozier are there that we don't hear about? The same way that if there's these two incidents that we're capturing on camera, police brutality, Michael Brown, Eric Garner, how many other things do we not see because no one's there? with their cell phone. So the fact uh, of that news story popping up pointed to so many other things that you know, we'll never hear about. Um, this feels uh, you know, much more rooted in, in reality than some of your previous work. So do you feel like uh, part of the process of writing this was, um, the, the way you speak about it is almost a little bit more the, w the way that I think of journalism, um, like bearing witness or sort of bringing this story to light. Um, yeah, no, I mean, I did feel uh, I wanted to get the, the real life story, the stories of the people who went there, if I could like, approach the truth of what happened to them, the book would be successful for me artistically. Um, uh, but, you know, it, it is a book of realism. The Underground Railroad has a fantastic structure. And you, you pick the right tool for the job. Um, sometimes uh, uh, magic realism is useful, sometimes realism, sometimes a first person narrator or a third person narrator, a, a narrator who speaks in postmodern five clause pileups, sometimes <laughs> a, a more direct narrator. So before I start writing, I always think about the, the best approach. I knew this book would be short, I knew it would be realistic, and because that would best serve the story. And the, the shortness is intentional because it just, you've 
Why is um, that? I think, you know, in order to get the reality of the place across, it was not going to be like 300 pages. Like okay. it was, I knew uh, I, could, I could get the reality down uh, in a couple of chapters and then, you know, follow the, the thread of the adult student later on. Um, and there's also just something nice about having a constraint, like being mm -hmm. short. Um, and, and doing the research on top of, you know, reading newspaper accounts. I read a lot of novellas and I was studying people like um, Dennis Johnson and Julio Tsuka and uh, Mohsen Hamid, uh, who've written, you know, really uh, compact and beautiful books. And I was studying like, what can you leave out? What do you take, what do you leave in? What, what can you take out in a short novel? So just that kind of exercising that muscle uh, was good. I've written books that are really digressive and uh, not as controlled, so thinking about control was, you know, sort of good for me. Um, the thing that struck me about this book, um, one of the things, is that you really captured the sort of spirit of hopeful ambition of, of black Americans in the mid-20th century. Um, and, you know, one of your characters is, um, is more idealistic and optimistic, and, and others aren't. So why did you find that this was something that you know, the characters would sort of wrestle with? Yeah, I mean, um, I think he evolved over time, but I knew he'd be sent there for no good reason. Um, hmm. And so Elwood, uh, the first person we meet, is a um, straight-A student. And uh, he's hitchhiking to take college classes and hitchhikes in the wrong car. The car has been stolen. So he gets sent to, to Nickel Academy, um, just in a twist of fate. The same way that so many young people, young people of color are swept up into the justice system uh, by being in the wrong corner at the wrong time, or they're, they reach too quickly for their wallet and the cop mistakes it for a gun and they get shot. At any moment, you know, your life can be altered. And so I wanted to capture that. Um, when I was figuring out when the book should take place, you know, it could have taken place in 2010, it could have been 85, uh, 1924. I picked 63 because it's um, the height of the Civil Rights Movement. You know, next year we have a Voting Rights Act, Civil Rights Act, um, but it's also the height of Jim Crow, and, that's, and that sort of contrast uh, was appealing to explore. And so Elwood has grown up seeing advances in terms of civil rights. He's, he works in a stationery store, and every week he gets a copy of Time magazine and sees Dr. King and the other crusaders and what they've accomplished. Um, and so capturing that the hope at that time was important, uh, but always waiting is Nickel, is Jim Crow, and the sort of reality uh, that is a, a strong force opposing all those hopeful energies. Um, so in some ways, I kind of, you know, as I was reading it, I was thinking about you know whether the idealism was was the right approach. It was almost like a, a debate that was not um, overt, but sort of threaded through some of the tensions that some characters had. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the secondary character is Turner, and he's an orphan. The kids who got sent to Dozier, they were juvenile delinquents, uh, but also he gets sent there for um, being an orphan or a ward of the state. Basically, if you had nowhere else to go, they, the state would warehouse you there. And so he's always lived by his wits and doesn't think that systems change, people change. And he's more cynical, pessimistic, realistic, depending on you know, where you, where you want to uh, fall on that. And definitely, when I was trying to figure out what to write in, the March, in March of 17, when I, you know, my schedule was clear, I had, had an idea for a book and the Nickel Boys. And I stuck with the Nickel Boys because um, I was feeling that debate myself between optimism and pessimism. Trump had only been in office like six weeks and he was already just like a bigger disaster than you can ever conceive of. Um, so where was the country headed? You know, do I have the right to believe that we're getting our shit together? And, and uh, or, or are we um, still stuck in this really sort of primitive state? Um, and so, you know, I was grappling with my own debate about pessimism and optimism. Um, and I think when I tapped into that, you know, definitely that became part of the book as well. Um, do you think that the conclusion sort of uh, settles the matter or are you just 
do you still think it's a, something that you're, you're wrestling with? Um, well, personally, I'm definitely more Turner these days. Yeah. I mean, there's not a lot of evidence to the contrary that we're getting our shit together. Um, in terms of the book, you know, do Nickel, the dozer stand-in, is, is a pretty terrible place. Uh, but that's two-thirds of the book. The last third is following Elwood as a grown-up as he tries to put himself together. You know, some of the people who were at Dozer were ruined, turned to alcohol and drugs, uh, became habitual criminals, never sort of figured out how to fit, in, fit into society. So narrating the travel of Elwood from, as he tries to come back from this catastrophe that's put him off his life's path was important. And so there is that, can he make it? Can we, can we change and progress? Um, that notion is you know, an important part of the book. And then a reader can decide whether um, his fate, the fate of other characters, uh, makes you think that the book is more optimistic or the, or the opposite. Um, I also want to talk about your use of history because um, this does feel like um, one of your works that has um, a much more a, sh a sharper point than some of the others, although Underground Railroad did as well. Um, you know, in, in an essay that you wrote for the Times, and um, I guess I write a lot of Times essays. I, you know, you did actually. <laughs> in searching for you in our archives, it's like turned up a lot of little gems. Um, but uh, you kind of were writing about New York City, right? And you were writing about people's impressions of New York City. This is after 9/11. Um, um, and about the fact that people could, you know, people's version of reality is, is based on their experience, um, their own experience of a place. So, you know, if you haven't seen a canal on Canal Street, it doesn't feel like there was one there. Calling the Pan Am building Pan Am, even though it's MetLife building, or superimposing right. uh, the bookstore or shoe shop that was there 10 years ago over the movie theater. Right. The love store mm -hmm. is now a Dwayne mm -hmm. Reed. Yeah, so. <laughs> the love store. I think I missed it. It's the nineties, okay. baby. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, so, I mean, basically, though, right now it seems like you know you're you're focused on sort of resurrecting history in a more realistic sense. Do you think that it is more important now that we have a, a collective sense of history? even um, though we might have a different perspective on the past? I don't know, you know, I don't, I'm, so, I'm sort of, um, I mean, I'm glad like, you know, Underground Railroad travels a lot of American history and it exposed people to our eugenics programs, our forced sterilization, it made people aware of like uh, various moments that aren't taught really well in American history. Um, so that's good. I'm not sure what kind of change it affects. Yeah, I don't know, I'm mm -hmm. sort of pessimistic. I mean, I think the people who um, might extract a, less, a real lesson from the Nickel Boys are necessarily gonna read it, you know? I think the people who um, are in charge of the structural levels, levers of power don't necessarily read a lot of novels, unless it's like, Beyond the Valley of the Dolls or something, or I don't even know what they read. <laughs> it's a perfectly good novel. Um, so I'll know. I mean, I don't know. So it's for, the, the, the point though is, is for you and less, and maybe for your readers and less so for, there's no sort of activism that's inherent and taking on these topics. It's what people get out of it. I mean, for me, I'm really just trying to, I'm not trying to teach people. Um, I really am just trying to fulfill my own sort of artistic, personal needs. And um, what's compelling to me as a person and an artist, and sometimes the books are more personal, sometimes they're more about history, and sometimes I'm trying to figure out the world. Um, and then like, you know, we were talking about earlier, some people like this book, a zombie book, or don't like <laughs> that book. Uh, sometimes people come along for the ride, and sometimes they don't. Um, but really, it's, um, uh, I really am just trying to figure out my own sort of way in the world, and, and writing is one way of doing it. Um, and so, I don't want to say it's all about me, but it is all about me. 
pretty much. You know, you know. Well, I'm glad we're the beneficiaries yeah. of your yes, yeah. self-indulgence. Yes. <laughs> um, so, um, you know, the other thing that's uh, very striking about this book um, is, is the tone, and you're like uh, kind of the master of this pithy and very evocative descriptions. Like you have, a, um, you describe one character as a walking flinch, which, you know, it's just two words, but I kind of like saw him. How long does it take you to come up with those descriptions? And I don't know, I remember walking flinch was like, that was like a, a couple of passes at the paragraph, you know, and then it got down from like a sentence to like those two words. And so there are things like that where I'm like, phew, I finally figured out that paragraph. And, uh, <laughs> Um, but, uh, you know, hopefully the more you do something, the, the more, you know, the better you get at it, whether it's writing or being a plumber or a heart surgeon. Like if you're a heart surgeon, after 20 years, hopefully you're killing fewer people. Um, <laughs> and if you're writing for 20 years, hopefully you're getting better at zeroing in on what's the heart of this paragraph or heart of this character and getting things onto the page. And so, um, um. And how do you measure like whether you're getting better though? How do I measure? How, whether you're getting better. Or like what's, how, you know, what's successful? Like oh, when you're I mean, done I, with that paragraph, how do you know you're like, okay, walking flinch, I'm done, I'm good. Yeah, I mean, uh, you, f you feel good. You know, there's always something, you know, there's definitely that paragraph that for six months is just like, what is wrong with you? What is wrong with you? Then it's like, flip the clauses. And then it's like, all right, you know, mm -hmm. I flipped the clauses and it fit perfectly. Um, so, you know, I, I know when I, at this point when I'm, I'm proud of a sentence or a paragraph or I'm doing something I could have, couldn't have done like 10 years before, and I felt a lot with the Underground Railroad, having written in, in a, a more digressive mode with Sag Harbor and John Henry days, there were moments in the Underground Railroad where um, I would do a scene and, I, and there was two pages and so I was on, on to the next thing. But I knew that if, like old Colson, this would have been like some postmodern, like, you know, uh, pyrotechnic uh, set piece. Um, I think especially of like the, the museum chapter when Cora works in a museum of natural wonders. And like old Colson would have been like, here's the curator, and what's like his theory, or who, who built the Underground Railroad, and how they do it, and who determined the right of way. Um, and I knew there were various moments in that book where I was like, Goodbye, old Colson, you know, and, uh, <laughs> and um, or nailing a character in a certain way that I couldn't have done 15 years ago, and, and that's sort of obvious to me, like uh, when something uh, comes out the way it should really quickly, and it's like, oh, you know. So is old Colson, I like this, like, you know, this new person that we're meeting, um, it was, uh, is old Colson just like, you know, were you more, um, like less wedded to a particular um, approach? Um, or, you know, were you more pre less precise about this is the way I'm gonna write this scene? Um, or was it just... I think, uh, I mean, like, choosing to write a short novel, The Nickel Boys, like, um, that's new and it's a challenge. Mm -hmm. And figuring out the form uh, was fun and also challenging. Um, I think definitely uh, in my 20s and 30s, you know, uh, reading Ralph Ellison and, and Thomas Pynchon. Uh, uh, I love their sort of, you know, sort of ecstatic uh, grand scaffolding. And, and that was a, a big, a, I found it interesting to have a sort of panoramic take on social structures and then zoom in on characters and having that different kind of register. And that was just a way of telling a story. And, and then at a certain point, I did it, so I can do something else. And I may go back to that, you know, uh, if I don't kick the bucket anytime soon, I could go back to that. Uh, but at the moment, you know, mm -hmm. it's been nice to write in a different sort of way, and if I keep writing books, I get to, I get to uh, pick up and, and drop different ways of telling a story. Okay. Uh, I wonder what, um, you know, 10 years from now, you will refer to this well, I'm getting shorter in terms of the book, so it could be like a tweet. I could just be doing tweets, <laughs> you know, like, instead of books. We'll see. Let's hope not. <laughs> um, the, 
the other thing that is, is pretty interesting about this book is that, um, you know, um, Elwood and, and, and Turner also is, um, they're viewed as these people who have potential, um, you know, authority figures recognize them as people who, like, you know, can bear more responsibility and they're sort of singled out. Um, I'm just wondering how much um, of those characters is like, is that something that you saw? Is, is there any of you in, in that sort of aspect of the characters? Yeah, I mean, um, Chiano. Um, definitely I am in some of my characters or I'm drawing mm -hmm. from people I know for some of the supporting characters and sometimes not. Um, Cora in the Underground Railroad mm -hmm. definitely has the least amount of me in her, which is probably why it was a big bestseller. <laughs> um, uh, but you know, I'm partially in Elwood and partially in Turner and partially in the, in the other the other kids. Um, but in terms of that aspect of being recognized uh, that you're going places, no one really took that much of an interest in me growing up. <laughs> like uh, I always get asked, like, was there a teacher or like, yeah. a mentor? And I'm like, nah, not really. Nobody <laughs> looked out for me in that sort of way. So um, you watching Kubrick? So, so just sit in my house watching TV <laughs> and yeah, sort of thing. All right, um, and and what about their treatment and their experience with racism? I mean, you've you've talked about kind of being. Um, I've seen interviews when you've talked about sort of seeing police and thinking about it and. Um, well, I think you know, uh, when I was writing, the Underground Railroad and researching, and I come across slave narratives, and they mm -hmm. they would former slaves would talk about being stopped by slave patrollers, <laughs> and they would use the same language. Slave patrollers were like cops before they were cops, and they would stop any black person free or enslaved and demand to see their free papers, and you better have a travel pass or a free paper. Um, and the way they described being stopped was the same way I've sort of described being stopped, and I'm sure the kids in, in the Nickel Boys would have that same language. So there is that continuum of oppression, humiliation, uh, uh, that goes from slave patrollers to some white law enforcement now, uh, and then in the 60s with the, in the time period of the Nickel Boys. Um, so, but then again, it's not me. I think most young people of color, most, most uh, uh, poor people are policed in a way uh, that was similar 100 years ago and 50 years ago, and is still now. Um. So you describe being stopped as like a fairly routine thing, though. I mean, that's um, not, The one time I was handcuffed, that was like a rare thing. Uh, but, you know, um, uh, I don't have a license, but my friend's driving and we're stopped for no good reason. And I think that's, that was, you yeah, know, was pretty routine um, uh, in my teens and 20s. Um, you also, like, and I don't know that this was uh, related to race, but it seems like it could have been. Um, you panned a writer in, in our book review, yet another. Um, another Times piece, yes. Another Times piece, yeah. I, um, but, um, and the, I've only heard one version of this story, but the, the, the writer like saw you at an event and, and spat at you, on you, and something like that. It was Richard Ford, I panned uh, his, his book of, <laughs> His book of short stories, The Multitude of Sins, that mm -hmm. book that everyone talks about. Um, and uh, two years later, he came up to me at a party and was like, you spat on my book and spat on me. And he was about race. You know, he, mm -hmm. he did call Anatole Briard, who was a black book critic at the Times, the N-word. Um, so there's some evidence, maybe. <laughs> okay. uh, he has some issues there. Um. So those do those experiences inform your writing now and, and these characters too? Or is that, you know, is, is writing a tool to kind of reckon with your own experiences is my basic um, question. Yeah, I mean, sometimes definitely. I mean, I think uh, sometimes I am really present and then sometimes not at all. You know, I think my most autobiographical book, book even more than Sag Harbor is like mm -hmm. The Colossus of New York which is sort of oh, right. impressionistic mm -hmm. essays and I'm zooming in and out of different people's heads and pulling back and, and zooming and uh, uh, inhabiting different sort of city types and there's not much of a filter there. So I feel like really al alive in, in that book even more than 
my non-fiction book when I'm a character or, or Sag Harbor. So, but that, then again, like I'm totally absent from Underground Railroad. So, um, so sometimes I'm there and sometimes yeah. not. Um, what's interesting about your work now is um, you, you were on the cover of Time Magazine this summer, was it? And you, it were, was, you yes. were like, you know, an American writer looking um, very dignified and, and thoughtful. Um, so what's interesting about your work now is that perhaps because of the last two novels, although you've had black characters throughout your career, um, I do think you get a lot of questions about race and, and reckoning with race. And so I'm just curious about what you, what decisions you're gonna make when you're writing about um, characters and, and, what, and inter, what sort of ideas you'll entertain going forward. Um, well, my, my next book is, um, it's a crime novel set in Harlem in the 60s. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, it's not so much about race in the same way as the last two books, it's more about crime <laughs> and uh, <laughs> sociopathic behavior. So, you know, some books, uh, you know, race is important. Um, it's not so much, not very important in my poker book or, or my New York book. Um, and sometimes the city is a big character and, and sometimes not. So I think in terms of making a decision, it's what's most compelling to me as, as a person and an artist. And that's sort of the first thing. Um, and then in terms of getting asked about race, you know, uh, um, I think it's now less so in America, but Underground brought me a lot of new readers abroad, and definitely they have no context for American blackness or race as, as we know. And so I'll do like five minutes in the book, an interview, and then like half an hour of like ask a black guy a random question, which is like a genre. Um, and it's only like the wider the county, like the weirder the question. <laughs> what are the questions? Um, <laughs> why is Obama considered black when he has a white mother? Like, I got that a few times. Um, Did you, what was your answer? <laughs> I was like, it's racism. America. It's like, yeah, it's like, uh, <laughs> I didn't make the system, you guys did. So, um, uh, um, and then I got some weird ones, even more weird ones lately. It was like, oh, you went to private school, um, so you're upper middle class. Have you ever experienced racism? <laughs> it's like, they call it racism because it's based on race, you know? Um, so, and then, you know, people read the book and think that the Underground Railroad is like a real railroad beneath America. <laughs> um, but it also happens here too. So I remember I gave a talk in Florida a year and a half ago and a woman in her 60s uh, was like, have there been any studies about the cave-ins? And I was like. <laughs> and she said, well, it was, the, the tunnels were so deep underground, have there been any studies about the cave-ins? And I was like, really? You know, so. <laughs> so. Yeah. She must have been really sad to hear that. <laughs> like, it's one of those Santa Claus moments that you encounter. Um, I kind of want to ask some, some more about your other works. Um, you know, it seems like once you've written a, a book, the, the, it feels like the characters are behind you, like they, you know, um, like Cora's no longer with you in your thoughts, maybe necessarily. No, um, I mean, definitely uh, when I'm done with something, I'm really sick of it, and so, like, uh, <laughs> Zone one, you know, my zombie dream stopped. It was really crazy, because mm -hmm. I, I had them for decades. Um, I wrote an essay about fried chicken in the spring and cooking fried chicken and, you know, different recipes I've tried, and then I haven't made fried chicken since. I'm really upset, like, I'm really upset. <laughs> like, it was really important. It was a big feature of my life, you know, and now I have no interest. So when I'm done with something, I'm really done. Mm -hmm. um, but in terms of, like, Cora, you know, look at the last page, 30 pages of the Underground Railroad, when I was done, I was like, this is like the best thing I've ever done, you know? <laughs> and, I and I just lived with that sort of happiness for like nine months, just like, wow. I did a good job, you know, good job, Colson. And then um, uh, I wouldn't want to revisit uh, the characters of Nickel Boys, and <laughs> um, in some ways I can't, because <laughs> uh, <laughs> they kicked the bucket. Um, but. Uh, <laughs> 
I am, I feel very fondly towards them, uh, you know, when I'm reading it or pick it up randomly. So, um, while I am sick of stuff when I'm done with it, uh, the more recent the book is, the more I, I feel like tied to it emotionally and, 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 and glad that I did it and it was a worthwhile thing to do. Um, who are some of your favorite characters, not just in this novel, but just overall? Um, I don't know. I mean, the, the older the book, the least, the less I like it. So, but Lila Mae Watts is a cool character. This is my first book, yeah. first female elevator inspector, kind of a badass. Um, uh, who else? Um, I don't know. It's such an awesome. <laughs> you don't miss them. I don't miss You're them that much. Them. Um, there's a character, there's a sub, Zone One zombie book. There's a, a minor character named The Quiet Storm, and I, I thought if I ever did a sequel to that book, it would follow her adventures and the, the apocalypse. And then um, time passed, and I realized I would never write a sequel to it. Um, <laughs> so, but the, the, I thought The Quiet Storm had a lot of potential. And then I saw, then I saw Mad Max Fury Road, mm -hmm. and basically Quiet Storm is like the, um, who's the female lead in that movie again? Charlize Theron. The Char Charlize Theron character. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so, in some ways, it's done, so. <laughs> um, the, um, well, one of the last questions I have, we, we have a little more time. Um, but given your range, um, I mean, the reason that I asked about being an American writer is that um, you have incredible range. And just what do you think looking back on your work, like what will be your con contribution to contemporary literature? Oh, uh, well, no, I mean, um, <laughs> I guess 100 years from now, if someone was like, he wrote 10 books, nine sucked, but one was really good. <laughs> That's a pretty good percentage, you know, I don't know. They're not for everyone, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> I mean, you know, do you like, I don't like 10 books of anybody. Uh, so oh, if you like one book from somebody, that's like a real gift, and you're lucky. Right. So if someone liked one of my books, I'd be pretty happy. I mean, they won't have any books because we live underground, because global warming will destroy the earth, <laughs> and we will burn the books for fuel. Um, <laughs> but yeah, that. <laughs> um. <laughs> The last two questions really are just about the way you write and the way that you're, you're, you'll continue to write. Um, and it's about, and about the way that you research. You, you seem like, because you write about these topics that are like just so obscure, that they, are, they involve a lot of research, a lot of time. Um, for Nicka Boys, you, well, you did a lot of research virtually, right? Was yeah, you? I mean, um, uh, it was, you know, the story of the Dojo School was covered extensively in Florida newspapers. Um, in the last couple of years, there's been some really great journalism from people like Ben Montgomery at the Tampa Bay Times. Um, there are photo archives uh, of the school. I write about the Christmas pageant, and there are photographs of the Christmas pageant online, um, Florida newspaper archives. The more research I can do from home, the happier I am. Because mm -hmm. uh, when I leave the house, there's too many the word is people, and if I can avoid <laughs> human interaction over the course of a day, I'm pretty glad. Uh, so the I'm, internet I'm is a real. I'm sorry, we're doing this. The to internet you. is a real uh, boon to me. <laughs> um, so did you go there though? Did you? I didn't. Um, you know, I think it's generally good to get that real writer badge and see things in person. Mm -hmm. um, and I intended to go, and I was like, I'll go next month. I, I was writing, and I would go next go next month, and then I got halfway through the book and I realized that whenever I thought about going to the Dozier School, um, this place where I've been reading so many stories about uh, people having their lives um, deformed, and I realized that I would only go there, uh, I, I got a real sort of panicky feeling, an angry feeling about going down there. It was a physical reaction to the thought of setting foot near the place, and I realized the closer I got to the end of the book that I'd only go with like a dynamite, piece of dynamite or a bulldozer to destroy it. Um, 
Uh, Hurricane Michael a year and a half ago actually did destroy most of the, most of the <laughs> buildings. Um, so uh, Mother Nature finally stepped in and you know, got some revenge, but. Um, well, you wrote a book that really brought it to life. It was hard to believe that you'd never seen it, so. Um, well, yeah, I'm also not an elevator inspector. Uh, you're not, yes, that's true, as far as I know. I'm a zombie hunter. There's an yeah. outbreak in Costa Rica my guys want to keep an eye on. But, um, <laughs> but sometimes you make it up, and that's like the fun, actually the hard part, but also the fun part is mm -hmm. making it up. Okay, so. great. Um, I think right now um, we're starting to circulate. Uh, we have some mics open. Um, people can start lining up if you have questions. Um, and I'm going to start actually to your, to that mic over there. Wow. Um, <laughs> All right. Just a long line. Me? It's a, yeah, your turn. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Hi, thank you so much for being here, Colson, um, and Monica, of course. My name is Nadia Asensio. I'm also a writer um, plays. Um, plenty of times when I write, my friends and family wince and flinch because they can see me, them, things that have happened, even with fictional characters. Right. How much of yourself is in your characters, specifically with the Nickel Boys. How much of yourself is in Elwood? Yeah, Thank I mean, um, uh, not so much Nickel Boys, but definitely in terms of the temperaments and outlook of the two main characters. Um, uh, Sag Harbor is about growing up in the 80s and is based on my life, but my life is really boring, so I had to make up a lot of stuff. <laughs> um, I was worried that, and I, based on the characters on my friends, um, but you know, the demands of the story were always more important than what actually happened. It was, it was a novel. And so each time, like my friend Jeff appeared, he would do something un Jeff like. So even though he was like the model, each time he appeared, uh, he'd be less and less Jeff and more and more Bobby. Um, I did worry about what people would say when it came out. And I, I ran to my friend Billy P. And he was like, I hear him in your book. I haven't read it yet. And that happened like two or three times. It was like, I hear, I'm here, I'm in it, your book. I haven't read it yet. You know, <laughs> Jeff was like, you know I do audiobooks. How come you didn't have me do the audiobook? Um, <laughs> so, um, but it, it does help to change the names. You might want to try that next time. Uh, so. Hi, my name is Renika Williams and I'm an actress. Uh, how much involvement did you have in the Underground Railroad limited series that Barry Jenkins is directing? Yeah, no, it's really cool. He's directing it now. Um, apart from a few conversations here and there, like I didn't uh, have anything to do with it. You know, if I'd worked on it, I wouldn't have written The Nickel Boys. So uh, it seemed like a good trade-off. Um, I did have one suggestion. Um, do you know the actor Walter Goggin, Walton Goggins? He was a place like a redneck white guy. Uh, I thought that a la Eddie Murphy in Dr. Doolittle and the Clumps, he could play all the white characters, like, <laughs> you know, with like makeup and, and CGI, he could be like a little white kid, an old white lady. Um, so I tweeted that to Barry Jenkins and didn't get a response, weirdly. Um, somebody was trying to surprise me with it uh, when they're done shooting, so. Okay. Well, congratulations. Thank you. Hello. Hi. Thanks for being here. Uh, my question is, when you're writing a scene where one of your characters is being brutalized, how, how hard is that? Because I'm thinking you have to either get in the head or you're some more technical. And by the way, I was able to ask the same question to John uh, Updike many years ago. So. Right. <laughs> About sex scenes <laughs> and Updike. Um, uh, well, I. I outlined the book uh, pretty thoroughly, and then so I sort of know it's coming up, and I'm sort of working on it in my subconscious. So like the big sort of violence scene in Nickel Boys, um, I was plotting it out for a long time. And then uh, Elwood doesn't actually get hit 
in the scene. Like he, he's, he hears the sounds of other kids, there's the anticipation, he's counting blows. And so it really is more psychological than actually uh, me describing the, 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 the belt coming down. Uh, because it's really about him and, and Turner. And so that does happen, and it is like three pages, not him getting beaten, but the anticipation of being dragged out. And then once I've done it in the book, I don't have to do it again. And so I can hang out with Elwood and Turner. And so um, uh, it wasn't hard. It was harder. I usually don't get have an emotional response to writing. But as I said, with like going down to Dozier, the last six months of the book were really, six weeks of the book were really hard. I felt really connected to Elwood and Turner and had set out a tragic path for them. And as I got closer and closer to executing it, I just felt bad. And I think maybe it's doing two heavy books in a row, Underground and, and, and Nickel Boys, that um, uh, took a lot out of me. But um, I handed the book in and played video games for six weeks, and that seemed to <laughs> pull me out of it. So. OK. Thank you. Hey, uh, my name is Satchel. I'm a student uh, at Special Music School, which is affiliated with Kaufman. Uh, Thank you for being here and giving this talk. My question is, as an author who's been recognized many times by various awards, what do you think makes a work worthy of literary merit? Um, what makes a, a, a work of literary merit? Uh, well, I think a, a movie, a, a novel, a poem, a song works when there's a sort of recognition between the receiver and, and the sender and the, and, the, and the piece of art. And so, um, uh, when I started writing, you know, I'd come out with some crazy sentence. I'm like, no one's going to understand this feeling. I'm such a weirdo. Um, but then I was like, well, there, had to, there are 7 billion people in the world. Like, there has to be one other person who's going to understand what it's like to get zapped by an air conditioner in the middle of August. And they're like, what is it? And it's like, oh, you know. And so if there's one person, there has to be 20. And there's 20, maybe there's 100. And so I just figured if I can find the right words, words to unlock an idea or a feeling, um, other people can have access to it and recognize themselves in it. So I think recognition is what makes a, a work of art worthy. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, um, who do you read for fun? <laughs> um, well, you know, I go through phases. and. Uh, I'm trying to get back into work, and so I'm like, I don't want to read anything. So basically, I'm writing a, a, a crime novel that's very much inspired by Chester Himes and Richard Stark. And so I can only read Richard Stark. Luckily, there's 30 Richard Stark books. Um, I started, uh, um, I started some books, I haven't finished them. But I want to read Housekeeping by... Uh, uh, Marilyn Robinson. I've, I've started, I started two days ago. Um, so, but uh, nonfiction, fiction, all sorts of things. Nothing really I can put a handle on. Hey, uh, thank you for this wonderful talk, Monica and Colson. Um, I'm a reporter, and I was really interested in your shout out to, I think it's Ben Montgomery and his work. And I was even more interested in that some of the lines um, from your characters are actually real boys, uh, right? In your acknowledgments, I, I hadn't read that before. Um, really interested me it was the pitfalls or the promise that fictionalizing something that really happened uh, can have? What are the risks in doing that? And what is the more that we can get out of it from a fictionalized account than the work by Montgomery? Yeah, there's not more, or this is different. You know, I, I'm not a hard news guy, uh, so I stick to what I can do, which is write fiction. You know, I wouldn't go up to Charles Darwin and say, oh, Origin <laughs> of the Species is really cool. How come you didn't do an interpretive dance? You know? Um, <laughs> so. <laughs> it's just different. And Is that what I just asked? I'm sorry. A history. <laughs> a, uh, uh, journalism about something, uh, uh, a historian's account, there are different ways of approaching something, of, of, of getting a truth. Um, uh, in ter I, I, uh, pitfalls. I could have said the story in, in you know, like 2010, like I said, I could have just had the idea of like a terrible reform school and not stuck to the history of, of Dozier. 
Um, but I felt I was writing about the place and I wanted to stick to um, the story of, of Dozer, which I hadn't heard about and was not well known and um, is a you know, sort of terrible chapter in, in our history. And so I kept a lot of the real details. And I do quote uh, one kid, one of the survivors of the school, you know, they post their stories on a website. I read a story about solitary confinement and, and one of the lines was really haunting, so I stuck it in there. Um, so, and part of that is playing tribute to these different people who are influenced. And I could have paraphrased and or made my own lines that are similar, but wanting to have their voices in there, you know, even if it's just like six lines throughout the whole book uh, felt important to me. But, but also I didn't have to. Hi, I'm Hannah. Um, okay, so coming from somebody who's recently found what they love, right? I think when you're doing something you love, inevitab inevitably the shadow of yourself comes up and says, you know, you're not enough, right? Especially when it comes to creative things. And my, my question is, is if you've ever felt that, and if so, what have you done with it? And how have you let it affect you as a writer? My doubts and uh, fears. Yeah, that, you know, are you enough for this love and passion that you have of writing? Um, I think you are, but I'm just saying. No, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I think, you know, um, just because it worked last time doesn't mean that the new project's going to work out. Um, I'm stuck on a character or a scene, and I have to beat my head against the wall until I figure it out. But I know I will figure it out because I've figured it out before, but it may take a while. Um, the solution may present itself easily or more, or with more difficulty, but I will figure it out. But yeah, I mean, um, those doubts are still with me. I think they keep me honest, mm. so I don't coast. If I'm constantly saying, um, uh, don't screw it up, don't screw it up, that means that I'm scared that I, I might screw it up. And, that, that, and for me, that kind of thing keeps me honest, so I'm not coasting and doing a crappy job. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, my name is Ainsley, and I'm a sophomore in high school. And I was wondering what advice you have to, for young writers of fiction, specifically historical fiction. Yeah, um, uh, I guess uh, read and read and read. Um, to someone you like, uh, uh, figure out why, you, why, you, why the work speaks to you and how they achieve their effects. Um, that you admire. So read and read and read to figure out what kind of writer you are, uh, you want to be, and then write and write to figure, figure out what kind of writer you actually are. Um, but you have to do a lot of both. Um, you know, you write a story, it sucks, next, next one's a little better, the third one sucks again because you have a relapse. Uh, but, you learn, <laughs> but you learn from the sucky first and third stories to make the fourth story a little bit better. Thank you. Um, hi, thank you so much. And I'm also really grateful to Monica Drake for bringing up the task of bearing witness in your work. Um, you use sort of the ability of the novel to bring in imagination in a way that nonfiction isn't necessarily allowed to do in order to talk about people who can't speak, maybe because they have passed away or maybe because, you know, it's they're not given that forum in our society. So I want to ask, um, how do you bear witness ethically when people aren't necessarily here to be part of the conversation? In terms of ethics? So, right, I mean, because people aren't always here to speak about their own experiences. So when you write about those, those experiences using your imagination, how do you do that ethically? Um, I don't think about it ethically. I mean, I think uh, with the Underground Railroad, um, I was playing with history, and I was using a fantastic structure to talk about slavery. Um, so I did actually feel a duty to get it right before I got it wrong. Um, and so Georgia, the first chapter, is, a, is as, as realistic as I can make, uh, as realistic as I can get my version of a plantation. And so I felt a duty to my ancestors who were enslaved to get it right before I started moving things around. Um, uh, but there's no... Like union, I'm gonna kick, gonna get kicked out of, you know. I think, uh, um, and 
the Nickel Boys could have been just a trouble reform school and not, based, not set in Florida or any, and had no sort of real connection to the real place. Um, and I could have gone that way, but just for me, I wanted to, to stick close to, the, to Dozier. So in terms of how I, I consider it, I have my own sort of idea of what's right for the book. And I do, as I do have an amorphous idea of duty. Um, but also, I know I have complete license to make it up. Hi, my name is Jonah. I'm also a student at Special Music School. And I know you mentioned earlier um, that after an idea has been in your head for a while, you can start writing about it. But at what point does it, do you know that it needs to be turned into words in a story? Yeah, I mean, I'm researching outlining. And I have to know at the, the beginning and the end, the middle can be fuzzy. So the Nickel Boys, for example, I know that there's Elwood and Turner, and there's two other kids, but I don't necessarily know that they're Desmond and Jamie, and they have these different aspects when I start writing. You know, as I approach Desmond and Jamie's first appearance, then they start getting, I have to start thinking about them, and so. Um, but I know the ending before I start. You know, the last couple of books, I've known like the last image or, or sentence sometimes, uh, so I'm writing towards it. Um, uh, and, and that helps. And then I'm doing research. I'm reading stuff about Dozier, newspaper accounts. Um, Aaron Kimberly from the University of South Florida uh, was the one led a team of archaeologists, students, archaeology students, to dig up the graves at Dozier. And they did like a great 120-page history of the school and how everybody died and morphology, stuff like that. Um, but I know when I'm ready to start writing, when I'm really excited, like I'm just really excited to start working. I've been, had the idea in the back of my head for years, doing research, and I might not be done researching, but I really am excited just to get the first page out or the first you know, chapter. Um, and it's that feeling of, I have enough to go on to start, and I want to start. Okay, thank you. Uh, thanks for reading. Hi, uh, I'm Steve, and I write comic books. And thank you so much for coming and, uh, and uh, speaking to us today. Um, and I noticed, I was reading The Intuitionist recently, and noticed that you named the journalist character Ben Yurick. And I was wondering if you have ever entertained any thoughts of writing your fiction in any other media, for example, comics. No, sure, yeah. I mean, I uh, became a writer from reading comic books, like late 70s, Marvel, you know, Marv Wolfman, Bill Mantlo era uh, comics, and Stephen King, and then science fiction. Um, and in the late, Ben Yurick is a the newspaper character from Daredevil, and I think in the late 90s when I was writing, it had been canceled or it was in a very morbid. So I was like, I'm just gonna give a shout out to Ben Yurick in my novel, because <laughs> I can do that. <laughs> and, then, and then he was sort of rediscovered, and it's like all these different there's like TV shows, and like, oh, I use that name, like nobody sue me. Um, but um, uh, I've, I've been approached a few times, like definitely with the intuitionist uh, Karen Berger, who ran DC, like email, sent me a letter, like, would you want to do this into a graphic novel? And I was so mortified, I didn't respond. Like sometimes, like I meet famous people, I'm like. I'm not even gonna, I'm not gonna pretend this happened. I'm just gonna go over there. So, um, so the head of DC writing me was like too much. And I never responded. Um, <laughs> wow. And then, uh, and now not more novelists are writing uh, comic books. But the same thing with the, with the TV thing, I'm sort of have my ideas now and I wanna to get to them. And so maybe so if I run out of ideas or in between things and burnt out and need to change, maybe I would do it. But, it, but at the moment, I have some book ideas I want to get to, so. Awesome. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, I think that um, we're going to close. All right. Wow. <laughs> I think so. I just. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you.